I want to take a look at uh, this piece by Scott Lincecum on the Dispatch. It was put up a few days ago on May 8th, 2024. Political sacred cows inflate American grocery prices. Uh-oh, spaghetti Protectionism makes our already costly supermarket trips even costlier and for no good reason. And before I get into this, I want to add that it's uh, not just uh, protectionism from foreign competition that's uh, restricting competition that could uh, potentially be inflating prices. Even in the great state of Florida, I know I talked about this a few weeks ago, but it looks like uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis followed through on signing legislation banning the sale of lab-grown meat in Florida. That's just not smart. And what I found revealing about this, this is according to uh, NBC 8 in Florida, WFLA. They uh, put out a an article about this where they quote Ron DeSantis as saying, Today, Florida is fighting back against the global elite's plan to force the world to eat meat grown in a petri dish or bugs to achieve their authoritarian goals now first off it's worth noting that uh, merely offering uh, an alternative on the market for consumers to uh, decide whether or not they want to consume that's not the same thing as force ron you big buffoon but ron desantis added our administration will continue to focus on investing in our local farmers and ranchers and we will save our beef and what i find interesting about this is when you go back to uh ron desantis's feud with disney namely the uh, repeal of the reedy creek improvement district which was his way of you know leaning into the culture wars which i think he's doing right here this is just totally him using uh the powers at his disposal to uh wage culture war battles but in ron desantis's feud with disney a lot of people in DeSantis stand, including DeSantis himself, uh, tried to frame the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which was uh, Disney's deal with the state of Florida, where uh, they got control over their private property. You know, that was uh, framed by a lot of people in DeSantis stand and DeSantis himself as a uh, special favor, a special carve out or whatever, which it was not a special favor. And now we're seeing that Ron DeSantis is uh, not opposed to uh, doling out favors as he's uh, admittedly doing with uh, farmers and ranchers. They need to be protected from competition from uh, scientists, I guess. It's not only Ron DeSantis, though. Even Democrat Senator John Fetterman applauded this effort by Ron DeSantis. And after he got a little bit of pushback, Senator John Fetterman said... The beauty of democracy, people can join the pro bioslop caucus, but I'm in the pro ribeye one. <laughs> what I appreciate about uh, Fetterman's words here, I mean, I wouldn't say democracy, I would say a uh, mixed economy. This is the mixed economy. When you have a mixed economy with uh, a First Amendment and protections of free speech, that, uh, that necessitates a lobby system. It necessitates a lobby system of pressure group warfare where, uh, you know, the government, they're now involved in doling out favors and welfare and protections. And that's what's going to happen is they're going to get different factions in Congress and in the government uh, looking for uh, special interest groups to uh, give favors to. Oh, yeah. And John Fetterman, uh, the other day, he, uh, he was talking about how we need to decriminalize marijuana, legalize marijuana at the federal level, which I agree with him. But it's also a hilarious double standard. So what? According to John Fetterman, uh, consumers should not be allowed to uh, decide if they want to try lab-grown meat, uh, meat uh, produced in a laboratory. But they should be free to uh, eat gummy bears that will make them high as a kite for four to six hours. That's just not smart. Anyway, Lincecum writes, Americans are concerned about grocery prices and for mostly good reasons. Yes, as we discussed in February, consumers here still, even after years of inflation, spend a relatively low share of their budgets on groceries as compared with their counterparts abroad. 
But that does not mean the last few years have been easy for the United States grocery shoppers. As the chart below shows, prices at your local supermarket are up 25% since 2020. This trend, as Bloomberg notes, can weigh heavily on our views of the economy, a.k.a consumer sentiment because food is an obvious necessity and because unlike a house or a car we buy groceries all the time americans regular trips to the grocery store three times a week for the average u.s household are a powerful driver of economic discontent constantly reminding consumers of the higher cost of feeding a family. It's thus no surprise, or at least it should not be, that even after several months of moderating food prices, grocery shopping remains at the top of Americans' list of inflation worries. It's also not surprising that this has become a major theme of the 2024 presidential election, with each side pointing fingers at the other. On one side, you have Donald Trump blaming Joe Biden for the grocery grocery situation and in typical fashion, widely exaggerating the actual impact. While Biden's been furiously trying to blame it all on greedy corporations <laughs> and adding that things would be even worse if his tariff loving opponent were in charge in Congress, dutiful Republicans and Democrats are parroting these claims to push the candidates and their own case before American voters. For all this talk, however, it seems few people in Washington are actually interested in lowering U.S. grocery prices. Oh, uh, you absolutely suck! In several recent cases, in fact, they have been actively trying to increase them by restricting available supply. That's just not smart recent efforts to increase u.s food prices no really let's start with beef the price of which has increased by more than 30 percent since 2020 last december the united states department of agriculture announced after conducting two on-site health and safety audits in 2021 and 2022 that the united states would resume allowing fresh beef imports from paraguay a relatively small player in the global beef market Imports had been banned years ago because of concerns regarding foot and mouth disease, but Paraguay has been foot-mouth disease-free for more than a decade. This new competition apparently did not sit well with 13 U.S. senators from beef producing states, so they sponsored legislation to override the USDA decision and ban all Paraguayan beef from the U.S. market. Now, keep in mind, you know, I've uh, talked about this when reacting to uh, Robert Reich and his attempts to uh, scapegoat inflation. But even before 2020, I looked at a Robert Reich video where he was talking about the uh, monopolization of the American economy. And I recall him uh, talking about that a reason why beef prices were so high was because uh, four companies control Anywhere between 80 and 85% of beef packing, depending on the year. And uh, according to Robert Reich, that's a, that's a case of monopolization. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, dude. And especially since uh, inflation has gotten worse, he's, uh, you know, re-ran those uh, talking points. And of course, Robert Reich's solution to this is antitrust. Just break up the four beef monopolies, I guess. It's interesting that uh, th this is never proposed as a solution. Uh, dropping restrictions, pulling back restrictions on foreign competition. And as I've said before, th I think this shows a clear double standard from a lot of populist knuckleheads from both the left and the right, where they're all about uh, antitrust. Recall Republican J.D. Vance. He says uh, one of the few things he likes about the current Biden administration is his uh, appointing of Lena Khan to the uh, Federal Trade Commission because she's such a she's such a hawk because she has a raging boner for uh, for for wielding antitrust against big tech. On one hand, a lot of populist knuckleheads, they'll say that we need antitrust to create competition. And on the other hand, they say that we need uh, protections for American businesses, for American workers, for American farmers and ranchers. They need protection from foreign competition. Lincecum continues, the resolution passed the Senate in March by a depressingly lopsided 70 to 25 vote, despite strong 
White House resistance in part of national security grounds. Paraguayan beef exports have been hit by Russia and China because of the government's position on Ukraine and Taiwan, respectively. As roll call notes, politics, not science, not science, played a big role in the Senate. Senator John Tester of Montana, one of the most vulnerable Senate Democrats up for re-election this year, sponsored the resolution. And Tester's resolution has some influential lobbying clout behind it, including the American Farm Bureau Association and the Cattlemen's Beef Association. You know, this goes back to uh, Mr. Fetterman's point. You know, hey, uh, there's a pro-ribeye caucus. Yeah, there are a lot of senators who uh, seem to be interested in keeping uh, consumer prices high to, you know, uh, an effort to uh, give uh, kickbacks and favors to uh, American uh, cattle farmers and ranchers and whatnot. That's another thing about the populist right. They'll often look at the popu they'll often look at the left and the Democrats, especially uh, recently, with uh, Governor Gavin Newsom and his uh, recent uh, minimum wage standards for the fast food industry here in California. They're pointing and laughing at that, rightfully so, talking about how it's uh, leading to uh, increased prices for consumers. It's leading to uh, layoffs and job losses in the fast food industry in California. It's leading to uh, the failure of businesses in California. Uh, but the left will excuse that and say, well, 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 yeah, I I'm willing to pay a little more for a cheeseburger or a burrito if it means that the worker making it is getting paid a living wage. <laughs> the populist right will rightfully condemn that, and then they'll turn around and advocate for basically the same chicanery when it comes to protections. They'll advocate and lobby for uh, tariffs and restrictions on foreign competition. And if you uh, note the uh, consequences, higher consumer prices, uh, potential job losses, business failures and whatnot, then they'll say, hey, 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 hey. I'm just looking out for the farmers and the and, and the ranchers, and, and, and I'm willing to pay a little more if it means that they're getting paid a living wage. Anyway, Lincecum continues, of course, importing be beef from a smallish producer like Paraguay would not be a magical cure for skyrocketing American beef prices, but that also means the imports present a tiny competitive threat to giant U.S. producers and restricting even small supply additions at a time when Americans are struggling to pay their grocery bills makes no good sense. Every little bit helps. And while we're here, you know, uh, every once in a while, I'll see people uh, getting all bent out of shape on Twitter, especially um, the populist left and the populist right. They get all bent out of shape about Bill Gates buying all the farmland in America. Yeah, they were all mad about this. It's, uh, this is just back in March. And, you know, I've seen this for years. You know, I guess Bill Gates, I guess he now owns 275,000 acres throughout many states. Often my knee-jerk reaction is, okay, where is all of the outrage and the pearl clutching over the fact that the federal government currently owns over 600 million acres of land in the United States, which uh, then gives them more power over the economy. But then I look at this and, uh, you know, I can't blame Bill Gates for uh, buying a bunch of farmland because uh, American politicians have signaled probably for over a century at this point, you know, going all the way back to the New Deal, that they will bend over backwards to uh, give American farmers protections, subsidies, protections from uh, competition. And if they have a bad year or a bad sales season or whatever, they'll get bailed out by the federal government. They'll get uh, welfare and a federal aid to keep their farm afloat. You know, why wouldn't someone like a Bill Gates buy farmland when uh, that's, uh, th that's what the politicians are signaling? Hey, if you have a bad year, we'll protect you. Hey, if you're getting a little uh, too much competition from overseas, we'll protect you. Lincecum continues. Next, there's shrimp, which has actually experienced declining prices since 2020, thanks in large part to abundant imports. That foreign competition, however, angered U.S. shrimp producers. Blow it out your ass. Who petitioned the government in October for a new trade remedy, anti-dumping and countervailing duties, restrictions on imports of frozen shrimp from Ecuador, Indonesia, India, and Vietnam. 
Those investigations are now underway with the Commerce Department recently announcing preliminary duties on the Ecuadorian and Indonesian imports, restrictions that, unsurprisingly, politicians from shrimp-producing Gulf states have vigorously supported. As we've discussed, these cases almost always result in new import taxes that stick around for years, if not decades, and will inevitably increase the price of shrimp at your local supermarket, as they always do. Finally, we have tomatoes, which have fluctuated in price since the pandemic began, but have gotten more expensive since last year. Here, Florida tomato growers have been working for months to get the Biden administration to increase tariffs. Oh, uh, you absolutely suck! I guess anti-dumping duties again on Mexican tomatoes, part of a long simmering dispute suspended in 2019 via government to government agreement over the bilateral tomato trade. Florida growers and their congressional friends, almost 60 of them, have long opposed that deal, which if terminated could cause U.S. tomato prices to increase by 50 percent. And yeah, Florida, again, just has a long history with uh, protecting farmers between uh, sugar protections, sugar subsidies. Now we got uh, the governor of Florida protecting them from uh, lab-grown meat and uh, scientists, I guess. And now they're getting, uh, I guess, tomato growers are getting pr uh, protected from competition from Mexico. Recently, a United States court found issue with the Commerce Department's handling of the case, a decision that Florida growers promised to fight, too. More of the same. These recent actions are just the latest examples of longstanding U.S. food protectionism. The shrimp cases, for example, follow duties applied since 2005 to imports from other major global suppliers with geographies and climates well-suited for production. Thailand, China, India again, and Vietnam again. Those have been in place since 2005. New duties would block almost all the world's largest shrimp exporters from a U.S. market that cannot be satisfied by domestic shrimp alone because consumer demand far outstrips supply and because wild-caught shrimp, unlike farmed imports, face natural and regulatory barriers. The tomato dispute and related restrictions, meanwhile, have been around for 30 years, ever since NAFTA phased out tariffs on Mexican tomatoes and U.S. producers with less sun, more hurricanes and higher labor costs realized they could not compete. Thus, higher U.S. tomato prices have basically been the norm since the 1990s. Overall, there are 38 anti-dumping or countervailing duty orders on various foodstuffs and several more investigations now ongoing, all pursuant to laws expressly intended to increase domestic prices so higher price U.S. producers can can compete in the market and that bar investigating U.S. agencies from considering consumer harms or broader economic problems like inflation. On beef, meanwhile, the incident with Paraguay is just the latest in a long series of efforts by U.S. cattlemen to limit foreign competition under the guise of consumer protection. Most famously, we had mandatory country of origin labeling requirements during the Obama years that imposed burdensome new rules on most imports and cost American meat packers, retailers, and consumers billions of dollars. <laughs> Those rules were terminated after years of litigation and recently replaced with voluntary ones, but the cattlemen and their congressional champions continue working to reinstate the costly mandatory regime via legislation. As I explained in an old primer on U.S. agricultural protectionism, this kind of regulatory protectionism is also relatively common. We have long maintained regulatory restrictions on imported foods like tuna, catfish, and biofuel imports to protect special interests without any legitimate health, safety, or environmental basis. It's just protectionism all the way down. Yeah, and guys, remember this next time some asset tries to tell you that it's all about China, 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 China. Blow it out your ass. Beef is also a good example of how the United States still maintains standard, aka most favored nation, tariffs on many food products, including healthy produce that cannot be easily grown in most parts of the country. Cantaloupes, apricots, spinach, soybean oil, watermelons, carrots, celery, okra, artichokes, sweet corn, Brussels sprouts, cut cauliflower, etc. 
Special tariff weight rate quotas further restrict imports on not just sugar, but also dairy products, milk, butter, cheese, baby formula, ice. Yeah, you guys remember the baby formula shortage? <laughs> Peanuts and peanut butter, canned tuna, chocolate, and other foods. And here we got a chart showing how the United States imposes tariffs on certain products. These trade restrictions also boost prices. The United States International Trade Commission in 2017 found that Americans pay 12% 15%, 21% more for imported tuna, cheese, and butter, respectively, because of the TRQs. And the USDA estimated in 2021 that the elimination of U.S. agricultural tariffs would increase consumer well-being by $3.5 billion per year. But wait. There's more. Produce marketing orders allow fruit, nut, and vegetable farmers to dictate their commodities requirements for sale on the fresh food market. Minimum prices, rigid inspection rules, and other terms of sale can insulate farmers from foreign competition, stymie entrepreneurship, increase domestic prices, and distort economic activity. All to American consumers' detriment. For example, the South Texas Onions marketing order implicitly creates quantity restrictions by mandating the quality and size of onions that farmers legally sell in this region. These barriers reduce competition and innovation by preventing farmers with other varieties from accessing the market, and they reduce onion supplies and thus inflates prices. Marketing orders can even encourage conclusion among farmers in a particular region, creating cartels that further boost prices. And then Linsica mentions the renewable fuel standard, which I've talked about in depth in other videos and uh, that impact on raising consumer prices on food. Separately, these measures may not add more than a few cents to our weekly grocery bill, but combined, they add up. Yeah, and I've talked about this in the context of uh, California. You know, every two years, California, especially in L.A., there are a lot of uh, new tax proposals in L.A. alone, but also in California. And every two years, every election cycle, I see voters going to the booths to uh, vote in a new tax and they talk themselves into it like, oh, it's just a little bit. It's just a few pennies here, a few pennies there. And, 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 we, and we can afford the extra cost if it's uh, going to help insert pressure group, insert uh, whatever uh, benevolent cause they want to give money to. And yeah, here and there, little tax here, little tax here. doesn't really sound like that much. But uh, after a while, all these taxes, not to mention the uh, costly, burdensome regulations, after a while, they uh, add up. And then uh, people wonder why the cost of living is so fucking high in California. And then two years later, they'll go and vote up uh, their taxes again. That's just not smart. Especially for Americans with lower incomes or large families who spend more of their budgets on food than does most everyone else. And maybe reforming this stuff was not a priority back when food inflation was modest, if not outright deflating. But now after years of inflation and with grocery prices at the forefront of the U.S. election, achieving a significant one-time reduction on U.S. food prices would be nice policy. And you'd assume a political win. Yet time and time again, when our elected officials are forced to choose between shaving a few bucks off Americans' grocery bills and delivering millions of dollars to their entrenched political benefactors, the choice is simple. We lose. <laughs> Although, uh, in the concluding paragraph, uh, Linscombe uh, says that there's good news, even with all these protectionism and cronyism, the long-term tide of American food abundance will very likely continue to roll in consumers' favor as long as... As long as individuals here and abroad remain relatively free to innovate and exchange goods, services, and ideas, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't look like that's uh, where things are trending with uh, the efforts of uh, populist assets in both parties wanting to uh, restrict even uh, domestic competition. <laughs> <laughs>